The Smithsonian Faculty Fellowship Program represents a rewarding academic professional development opportunity for faculty at Montgomery College. The fellowships are a product of a unique collaboration between Montgomery College and Smithsonian Center for Education and Museum Studies. It's the first of its kind between the Smithsonian Institution and a community college. Professor Patricia Rupert raised four children and a foster daughter with her husband, who owns and operates a landscape company and tree farm. She holds a BS in zoology from University of Maryland, 1975. Since her MA in theology, 2009, she has been teaching women's studies and philosophy at Montgomery College. She helps facilitate the college's peace and justice studies community. Patricia serves on the board of the Community Foundation for Montgomery County. So I teach morality and contemporary law, which is a philosophy course, and um, it's content heavy. It's not really a personal journey, although hearing all of you guys with these personal journeys, I, I'm going to try to make it one. <laughs> But, you know, we have to go through utilitarianism and deontology and virtue theory and, and all sorts of things. So I was really trying to figure out how am I going to make a museum work with these philosophical concepts. So I began with social con... Well, I came up with something that's really compelling to me, which is social contract theory versus communitarianism because they depend on very different what I call and what others call um, um, philosophical anthropology. But here are my students, high schoolers. So, I mean, the obvious thing about high schoolers is that now they are the best in their school because in order to take Montgomery College credit, they have to have completed all the other stuff. But they're high schoolers. So, yeah, obviously they're younger than most of our students. Um, but there are some other subtle things that you really have to, I really had to come to grips with. They have their own tribe. Every one of them knows everybody else in the classroom. Whereas you walk into a Montgomery College classroom and, you know, maybe one or two knows each other. But so there's this group think. And they're impermeable. So, okay, so that was thing number two. They're young, they've got this sort of group think going, and they have their own language, their own mannerisms, and I am definitely the outsider. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not the person who's going to teach them. I'm the person that they're going to see, you know, how they can get under the skin of. Not that they're malicious, just maybe mischievous. But then there's the whole social aspect of high school. Prom. <laughs> homecoming week. So it gets a little crazy. And then um, they are not, because they are such good students, they're all trying to check off their boxes to get into their colleges of their choice. And so they're not interested in mind-expanding kind of stuff. They don't want to step outside of who they are and take on another identity because that's death to them. You know, so it's these things that are just really, really interesting. And as a teacher, I've now taught um, at the high schools several semesters, five or six or something like that. But um, they are a challenge. So they're young, here they are. I mean, they, they really do look kind of young and they're a lot of fun, so. All right, so I had to try to get this concept across. Um, in the midst of all these other philosophical theories that we needed to study. So it was this philosophical anthropology, and anthropology has to do with what is the human person? Are we separate beings, as in our liberal tradition? And by liberal, I don't mean uh, um, as opposed to conservative. I mean liberal as in liberty, from Hobbes, Locke, Rawls all the way up, where we see the human person as being a distinct individual who negotiates with each other. And the, the critique of these kind of theories, I mean, it's very powerful theory. That's where we get life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, for heaven's sake. So it's very powerful, very robust, very ingrained in, in our, our mindset, in our worldview. 
But there's the critique levied against it that it's atomistic, that we exist as atoms, separate and distinct from each other, which is really different from what happens when you walk on the grounds of the American Indian Museum. You see those, those waves, and I think you do such a beautiful job, by the way, of doing the setting. Um, so when I set foot with my students there at the American Museum, the Museum of the American Indian, we are looking at the human person in a very different way, as an interconnected being, not just with each other, not just with the same generation, you know, the ancestors, the children to be born. There's that seven generation um, concept where what we do affects seven generations. So I say, okay, my generation, I could have every expectation or an expectation of knowing, of course, my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother and my child and my grandchild. And all of a sudden, the light goes on those students. They go, oh, yeah, you know, I could even know my great-grandchild. Seven generations. So trying to get that concept of the philosophical anthropology um, through is a little bit of a challenge with these um, not symbolic thinkers. So then we go into Hobbes, and some of them have on their Facebook, you know, life is solitary, nat poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So they've ha had a little bit of um, exposure to uh, Hobbes and then how from Hobbes' thinking, you know, he had this pessimistic view of humankind and its state of nature. Um, and that really feeds our liberal tradition in a very significant way, so that we become in competition with each other for scarce resources, and that's the basis that Hobbes will start from. So it's not this collaborative thing that we see over and over again all throughout the Museum of the, of the American Indian. So then I thought, okay, that's what I'm gonna do to try to contrast those concepts. So then we you know, go through life, liberty, property, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and so forth. So I'm trying to get them to understand where we are in our, in our US jurisprudence, and then where we hope to go in terms of just not questioning it, but examining and exploring it. What are the consequences that flow from that sort of philosophical anthropology? So then, this is part of the, what we came, who's, who's here, who's gonna be in the next cohort? Three of you, okay, that's nice. All right, so you'll hear about entrance narratives. I didn't know what an entrance narrative was, but it's what you do in the classroom before you walk through the entrance of that museum. So you take advantage of it. So here was part of my entrance narrative. I showed them this picture that, to me, illustrates the idea of this interconnectedness. You know, I see a bird that's wings are looking like mountains. And by the way, I don't see any human being who seems like the pinnacle of the creation. Maybe the human beings are down in the folds, teeny, teeny, tiny little human beings are down in the folds of the wings. But, you know, there's the, the atmosphere, the land, the sky, the moon, the bird, the spirit bird, you know, who knows what all's going on in here. But I give them the idea that then we are really talking about interconnectedness when, we, when we're going to set foot here on the, in, at the museum. So. so then I tried to come up with a mystical picture of the, of the uh, museum itself. Whoosh. <laughs> And that we're going to talk about interconnectedness with each other, with our ancestors, our descendants, with other creatures, with Mother Earth. Don't get me started on my feminism. I don't like to be called Mother Earth. <laughs> but anyway, you know, they, they know what I'm talking about. So, and beyond, beyond. So then I give them a couple of these images, um, uh, the Day of the Dead, as we've already talked about and as ancestors and then descendants, these are, uh, when you hear Paul Chat Smith, Beverly, you guys, you're really gonna love his, his presentations. Um, everything you know about Indians is 
wrong? Is that the name of it? Yeah. So, so this is the modern day iteration of you know, these, these tribal groups. And when you go down to the Museum of the American Indian, you run into today's Indians in a really, very real way. So then that would be the, the descendants. And then this idea of interconnectedness with the animal world. And you see masks there at the museum. Um, and then all kinds of things that have to do with um, furs from animals. And, and you know, we, we know the stories, or as Paul might say, Paul Chot Smith might say, the myths, I don't know, of the interconnectedness with the animals and the buffalo herd and so on. But these are images that prepare the student for getting ready to walk in the door. Mother Earth, um, you know, that's pretty interconnected looking if you ask me. And then beyond, and we talk a little bit about the sun dance, which is a ritual that um, takes place after ingesting peyote for quite a while. Um, and it's a religious, spiritual ritual that's being that's practiced. And in amongst, uh, we also study a, a court case. We go through 73 court cases in this class, and that's just the first half. <laughs> And then we go through um, a bunch of uh, philosophical articles written by various people. So anyway, um, so we talk about a court case where these guys were, were fired because of their peyote ingestion, even though it was a spiritual um, context. And I keep telling them, I bet you that case is going to get overturned. And that's a pretty interesting discussion. But we talk about how um, there's a transcendent feeling. So that goes with and the beyond. You know, you're connecting with everything here, but also way beyond. So then I get to the assignment itself. And I tell them on the red section, that's the, that's the heart and soul behind the assignment itself. I mean, I want the students to be able to begin thinking along these lines. But on the right side is the actual concrete, and I'm pretty structured with them. You know, if your last name begins with blah, 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 you go here and you do this. And I'm seeing how you guys are, you know, you'd go, that's way too much stru structure, but to me, I, I liked it, and they seemed to respond pretty well with it. Now, um, so they were supposed to immerse themselves at the museum and just try to explore interconnectedness. That's what I wanted them to do. So I wanted them to look at some objects and describe them in great detail and sketch them. This, that, here's another thing that you'll learn you guys in the next cohort is this object-based learning, which is really profound. And I wish we could pick these objects up. So if Manjula is ever going to look at this, Manjula, make it so we can pick, some, pick up something. I don't know. But you can't pick them up at the uh, museum. So I asked them to sketch it. So then the second thing they need to, needed to do was to go to the ceramics uh, exhibit, um, which is beautiful. Allison already um, talked about it a little bit. And I wanted them to first stroll through, like you were saying, Lincoln, you know, just see the exhibit first and then find an object that speaks to you. And then go up to that object, think about it, and I wanted them to write a story about them and the object. So again, this kind of interconnectedness. And most of those objects are animal forms of one sort or another. There's like this crocodile, big, and then there are you know, lots of tiny, you know, smaller creatures, but a lot of them, I would say 80% of them are animals. And then finally there was a quinoa exhibit, and what I wanted them to do there was try to connect with something in the present. So I asked them to look at the groups of people who were there, knowing full well that a lot of the people who come are native uh, heritage. So I didn't know who they would encounter, but see a group, and then I wanted them to pick the person in the group that reminded them of themselves, and then express some sort of form of connection. So, and by the way, what did you learn about quinoa? That would be <laughs> fine too. Which has a really interesting history. And there are lots of, you know, nice little interactive things that they could do. 
Oh, so back to that though. But eventually in their paper, they needed to compare and contrast the two um, philosophical theories. The one, contractarianism, based on this anthropology of distinctness and even competition, and the other based on an anthropology of um, collaboration and interconnectedness. And then ask themselves what ethical consequences would flow from those two different anthropologies. I mean, on the one hand, you lose your individuality. On the other hand, you lose a sense uh, of the greater good. So I was really asking them to explore these ideas. And then finally, I asked them in their own view, is it more authentic to exist as a separate being or as interconnected beings, which is kind of manipulating them. Because the reality is, and some of them said this, you know, I don't want to commit to one or the other. I want a both and um, ability. And so some of the papers, I'm, they were really interesting. Some of the papers came out, I want my individuality. I do not want to be ruled by my community. Some of them were way into, you know, the, 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 the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And then some of them didn't want to commit themselves to either or. So, things that didn't go well. All right, what the heck is philosophical anthropology? <laughs> That took a long time. So in class, we talked about, um, I had this mystery question of the week. So the mystery question of the week was, and it's posted online, they have to answer it online, and you'd be amazed what students will write online they would never say in class. Mm -hmm. And then they read it in class, and it's like they're proud of it, you know? It's really amazing. Mm -hmm. So the mystery question of the week was, um, when did you have to do something you didn't want to do because you were part of a group that you really liked being in? So they all could come up. You know, I hated selling Domino's pizza for my soccer team. You know, stuff like that. So they, they began to understand what I was trying to get at, this, this individuality within the group. So th what else didn't go well is the students were shocked. <laughs> I saw them all taking pictures with their cell phones instead of sketching on site. I mean, their cell phones can do everything now. Why not use them? Well, because you can't, so you just have to sketch. And then um, they had, you know, they've got this competition ingrained in them. It was all about, you know, how to do it the fastest get it done. So here were the remedies. All right, so then we did this um, number one group thing, individual within the group. And number two, I had to, I really had to assure them, I mean, because they're really into their grades, right, at this, this particular population is really into their grades. I said, it doesn't matter what the pictures look like. I just want you to authentically, sincerely engage with the object and draw it. And then, um, you know, it's so rare that they physically take pen to paper. So then the last one, I had such a fun time uh, with them. I said, look, you came to this, we got on Metro, we got down here, it's a beautiful day, look at this atrium, these prisms that are in the window, look at all the spectrums that are thrown around this room. Be here now. So they did. They, uh, they got, so the, I'm not a photographer, I'm very unvisual. But anyway, you can sort of see the spectrums for those of you who have not ever gone. Uh, it really is a beautiful space. So they relaxed, there was music, there was food. Um, and then I asked them, then when I really got them into the be here now thing and be one with your object, um, they, got, they really did. They kind of got, took these poses and they, uh, they really loved the part about uh, writing the story about them and their object. So one was a frog who became king of the you know, universe or something. Um, but they really got into it, and then this is just nearly, uh, this might be my last slide anyway. 
Um, so they sat down. They just plopped themselves down. I told them, you may not... If I get a typed written story about you and your object, I will not grade it. It has to be handwritten. And you have to do it right here now before you leave the museum. Well, I had 15 or 16 of them with me, and these um, museum goers were watching us. And the lady comes up to me. She said, what kind of class is this? <laughs> She said, this looks really fun. They got totally engrossed. I mean, that kid sat there for 15 minutes writing his story. So on that basis alone, I think I got the, I think I was able to communicate this interconnectedness in various ways. Um, they still seemed pretty befuddled by the whole experience, and I'll definitely have to tweak it. Um, but I did find that, yeah, with a, even with a content-heavy course like this, there are real opportunities of engaging in the world with each other, that triangle. Thank you for bringing that back up again. You know, that me, you, and the world, all three of us are somehow engaged in this education. Thanks.